See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. I start with the why. People aren't underserved. Communities are under-resourced. Health is more than health care. There are investments that need to be made to support people along the continuum of health, wellness, and resilience. And so we're getting to that when we start talking about social determinants of health. What makes us unique is the impact we aim to have in every community we serve. We jump in with both feet to affect the delivery system and to advocate strenuously in terms of policies that align with the type of change that help communities be stronger. Communities thrive when they have what they need. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. There is a growing body of evidence and experience supporting our understanding and investing in the social determinants and drivers of health those conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And we're seeing that manifest with a wide range of innovations in every corner of our healthcare system, including innovations in health plans, health insurance, and payment and delivery models. At kitchen tables across the country, and within Congress, the courts, and ballot boxes, the future of health insurance and coverage is discussed, debated, and decided. Health insurance coverage, policies, and regulations have been a national priority and an individual concern and on the verge of transformation for years, if not decades. But in a matter of months, the pandemic broke down long-standing resistance, reluctance, barriers, and ushered in an accelerated rethink, restructure, relaxation of regulations, and innovation at a pace that few could have imagined. In this episode, we learn what's possible. Well, actually, what happens when health insurance and plans focus on getting you care, helping you stay well, and building healthy communities designed to help those we're privileged to serve meet their full potential. My name is Karen Dale. I'm the market president for AmeriHealth Caritas District of Columbia. It is a health plan serving little over 100,000 district residents, providing the full benefits that they deserve to help them to be healthy, well, and resilient. My other role is at the AmeriHealth Caritas family of companies, where I'm the chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. Ensuring that we accelerate our progress in these areas, we build a strong leadership competency, and we are metric-driven in order to achieve superior outcomes so that our workforce is more diverse, health equity is achieved, and we leverage strategic collaborations to support communities across the regions that we serve. My philosophy is about starting with the human beings we serve and collaborating, co-authoring, and reimagining what would serve their needs best. I'm so privileged to work with a wonderful team of people, stakeholders, and members that we are privileged to serve that just give me over 100,000 reasons to (laughs) work hard and make good things happen. Karen, you are in one of my absolute favorite cities in the world, Washington, D.C. I grew up there, went to high school, college, early part of my career, and I go back as frequently as I possibly can. I would love to get your take, someone who's been in D.C. a long time and has deep commitment and affection and connections to the city. Talk to me about D.C. and how it's been for you and what it's like now. Absolutely. I am always very proud from the standpoint of healthcare that this is the best place to be advancing equity. 
We have had an enduring commitment over several mayors, several changes in city council members, both in financial commitment, focus, and execution to advance healthcare in the city. It's a journey, not a destination, so we're not there yet. However, our laws, our investments, our alignment has been unparalleled in terms of what else is going on in the country. Late last year, our city council passed a health equity plan. They will use that health equity plan to make all decisions. They will use it to evaluate what's most effective and what's going to have the best short and long-term benefits. So all those things make me really proud. I am so proud that we have a two-time female mayor. That hasn't happened before. And she is committed to progress and equity. So th- those are the things that are wonderful, that bring hope and will bring progress, that level of enduring commitment. We've also seen our city under siege because we're not able as a nation to come together and say what's in the best interest for everyone. It's become increasingly partisan focused. We've seen a resurgence of hate against Asian Americans, Blacks, Latinos. So we have this other piece that that's scary, concerning, and all of this playing out while we're in a public health emergency due to COVID-19. And so that's hurt our city in ways. It's hurt businesses. When businesses are harmed, families are harmed, communities are harmed. It creates more economic instability, which then creates a number of other crises. And so we work hard (laughs) to figure out ways to continue to be resilient and recover from that. And so we're focused on healing (laughs) and continuing to come together and be hopeful about what a new conversation, a focus on being more whole than separate might bring. You are at this really wonderful intersection. Being in Washington, D.C., we think about that as being the center and the epicenter of politics. Mm-hmm. And in these last couple of election cycles, health care, health insurance, access to care, cost of care, the services that are covered, who's eligible for coverage, these have all been in the headlines They've been the concerns and the topics for the past several years of the vast majority of voters. Poll after poll, headline after headline says Americans, and not just Americans, citizens across the globe, that their immediate concern is their family and their health and the health care costs. I mean, they've named it as a top priority, a priority that influences their their votes, who they're going to vote for. And I don't I'm not sure that we always make the association between politics, health and voting, you know, and, and thinking about that as a part of our health care. So sitting where you sit as somebody who's thinking a lot about the healthcare industry and health plans, you're coming at it through a public health lens. And at a moment where we're in this public health crisis and a social and a racial and an economic reckoning, speak to the concept of What is health insurance? What are health plans? I mean, in its biggest, broadest sense, because what we need to have right now is a radical rethink. And that's what you've been doing for several years is a radical rethink. At its broadest level, I start with the why. Health insurance gives us a mechanism to have good health, well-being, and resilience. That applies to all human beings. Good health, well-being, and resilience. In order to have that, there has to be a mechanism to pay for it. So there is commercial insurance, which is employer sponsored. And then there are the exchanges, which the person, the human being, right, that needs to achieve that health, wellness and resilience, uh, they have a part in paying for it. And then you have public programs such as Medicaid that the government, the state or jurisdiction where you live pays for, and then there's a federal match. The jurisdiction defines the benefits of coverage, right? So who gets covered for what set of services, and they budget for that, and then there's a federal piece. 
And you have Medicare, which is a federal program that has commercial components in terms of its structure, right? How things get paid for. So the person is paying for things, whereas in Medicaid, the person due to their financial circumstances doesn't pay for much or doesn't pay for anything. So that's at its most basic level. What challenges us in this country is that there are times where the lens people use to make judgment is around what type of insurance card you are carrying. So it really comes down to a card that covers all of those types of insurance, right? And when people have a card that says Medicaid, bias, judgment, and disparate treatment enters into the picture. And that's the part that really confuses me because I am not my insurance card. It's a card. It's just saying something about how the services that I need to be healthy, well, and resilient get paid for. And and that's where we struggle. The other piece is that if the pandemic has taught us nothing, it is that whether we want to all be connected, we are. Because as human beings, we carry infections, right? We spread germs, we spread viruses. So when you start making judgments about people based on their insurance card, and you're not thinking that, oh, I don't want that person to get care. However, you're going to end up that person getting care and or spreading germs and whatever, because we're all interacting as a human race. And so sometimes people are taking it to levels that I say, well, maybe we should just start at the beginning. Let's just start at the very beginning. Many times people think about insurance, even car insurance. There's a reason why states require it. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people are like, well, I'll roll the dice. Well, when you roll the dice, and again, you are interacting and around other human beings, you may roll the dice and what you failed to do in terms of insurance impacts them too. I believe everyone should have a mechanism to get insurance. How we pay for it as a country is certainly something to be considered. However, there are downstream and long-term positive impacts to making sure everyone is covered that would over time give a huge return on investment. In the beginning, yes, it would be more of a cost. And it would also force us to rethink how our insurance works. We're due for a rethink of how we get to people being covered, having the appropriate access, and right-sizing our delivery system. You bring up the importance of having a conversation. I'm, I'm thinking that we need to have a conversation about renegotiating our social contract with each other mm-hmm. and what it is that we value. I spend a lot of time thinking about and studying um, different systems of how we finance our care and our health and our disability. And you gave one of the most clear, easy to understand explanations. And it's still really confusing, Karen, but you have not been daunted by that. <laughs> you, you continue to take it on bravely and boldly. You know, with AmeriHealth Caritas, where you are, one of the things that really strikes me is that up front, you know, you talk about your mission, your mission being to help people get care, to stay well, and to build healthy communities. That is quite radical in the insurance world. You know, I didn't hear anything about stakeholders. I don't hear anything about profits or financial sustainability. So what is AmeriHealth Caritas? Who do you serve and what's your role in it? I play a dual role. I'm the market president for our health plan in D.C. I'm also the chief diversity, equity and inclusion officer across the family of companies. What makes AmeriHealth Caritas different is our enduring commitment. Most of our business is in Medicaid. We have some um, Medicare business as well. We have a pharmacy benefit management company, a specialty pharmacy company. We have a behavioral health company within our portfolio. What makes us unique is the impact we aim to have in every community we serve. It's our recognition that health is more than health care and that there are investments that need to be made 
to support people along that continuum of health, wellness, and resilience that involve starting with where they are, whether it's around economic security to internship programs for kids in high school, for people who are trying to start their careers and maybe more challenged by some of the circumstances or investments that weren't made for them. And so we're mentoring and supporting through paid internships, whether it's addressing food insecurity with meal delivery or grocery delivery. We're recognizing that communities thrive when they have what they need. I'm on this journey to get people to not talk about underserved communities, to avoid the deficit-based language that doesn't help us to understand why. People aren't underserved because there's something that they need to do, should have done. Communities are under-resourced because of decades and really hundreds of years of racism, redlining, discrimination when they go to get a job, go to get a loan, right? All of those things are what have caused us to have communities where we see the inequities. And so I'm really always happy to say I work at AmeriHealth Caritas because we care about that. We jump in with both feet to affect the delivery system and to advocate strenuously in terms of policies that align with the type of change that would help these communities to be stronger. You are way more than a health insurance company. I mean, you're really taking on um, putting your members and your family first. You see your members as part of communities and as part of families. And so you have this family first approach. It's not just the person who's enrolled Mm -hmm. in your plan. You take on the economic and the social issues that are the precursors to getting care or accessing care. Um, So it's, it's, way, way, way beyond what we think of in a traditional health plan. So as part of your bold vision, you've taken on some challenging topics, Black maternal health, food insecurity, violence prevention, and you have been innovating quite boldly and daringly in these different areas. How is it that you frame your innovation work, you know, or the set of problems that you're seeing that need to be addressed. How do you figure out what you actually need to do? I'm going to lead with two things and then answer that part. As a Medicaid plan, we have the best opportunity for success. When we help people, families, and communities to be healthy, we make more money. The way we're reimbursed, it's a per member, per human being, per month. And it's to cover all of their health care costs. So if the person only gets the minimum that they need, um, if the person is lacking things, both from the social and medical components, they're more likely to utilize more services. When we support, engage, and lift them up, they get healthier. And in other countries, one of the big differences between their outcomes and those that we see in the United States, it's because they really invest in the social component. And so we're getting to that when we start talking about social determinants of health. However, social determinants of health, we're looking at the individual. We've got to get to the level of analytics, predictive analytics, understanding, cross-agency collaboration, and blending of funding that allows for us to more seamlessly address the issues. So to get to what are the issues and how do we identify them? Well, data is certainly a part of it. So if you're looking at things, you want to gather enough information, not just from a claim, from doing things like a health risk assessment with our members, asking them questions about social determinants of health, and saying, if you take all of that information and you look at what publicly available information tells you about a certain zip code, which we know is a huge predictor of someone's health outcomes. That gives you a lot of information. I believe we should not just rely on data from a quantitative perspective, 
we should always go and speak to the human beings that we <laughs> intend to serve for several reasons. First, approaching with humility. We should be engaging so that you have an equal seat at the table to help to discuss and decide the path forward. Let's not have this be about members and the health plan, right? Let's have it be about human beings having a conversation. We have to think about how we create that level of equity to have a conversation to understand if you could change one thing in your community that would make it more resilient, what would that be? So it, it's taking an approach to hearing from the community first, even though we may have ideas, what's most pressing to you? Fun fact, when you look at zip code by zip code, as small a jurisdiction as DC is, there are differences, this block versus that block, in terms of how someone would answer that question. So you can't presuppose and come in with, I bet what you need is fill in the blank. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things that really struck me about how you're innovating. You always start with humility. Mm -hmm. You are there to listen and you're encouraging leadership from within the community. And that's what's helping you to make sense of the data that you've collected. You know, mm -hmm. are these things matching up? So other thoughts on how you're defining what are the needs and mm -hmm. where are we going to start? What my team and I focus on is the needs of a community, the perceptions and supports they need, honoring their preferences. And so from that springs the innovation. One of the things we did early on, several years ago, was we went from using a vendor who provided transportation in this way. We would schedule an appointment for someone, and let's say the person's appointment was at 10 a.m. That person may be picked up at 9.15 because there are two other people that are going to be picked up between the 9.15 and 10 a.m. And so... They've now used up that additional time to get to their appointment. And then the same thing happens when they're coming back. They may be the third person picked up. So that means after their appointment, they had to wait maybe 20, 30 minutes till the van picked up the other people who were scheduled in that ride, pick them up and then take them back home. On average, for an appointment that, you know, doctor's appointments, they're like seven to nine minutes, right? So, yeah, you've spent an so, hour for your nine-minute yeah, encounter. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, more like two hours for many of yeah. them. Because remember, it's the waiting for when they come. And then you go and you pick up the other people. You have your appointment. You're done. And then you're waiting until they come back, which could be 30, 45 minutes, depending on how the route was planned. So think about that if you had to go through that experience. When we talked to members about making it to their appointments and just trying to understand what would help, they're like, well. First of all, if I have children and I have childcare and or I'm going to try to take my kid with me to this appointment, I mean, this is crazy. And for someone who, for example, had to go for chemotherapy or dialysis after they're very tired. So to not have the opportunity to just get straight home. And so you have to sit and wait. So when we were in conversation, we understood and heard clearly their experience. They were thankful to have transportation. Yeah. However, they were like, can you make it easier? So right. from that came the solution of saying, well, what if we did Lyft or Uber? So the trip is booked directly. The driver doesn't know that what insurance you have because that's blinded to them. All they know is they have a trip. It works just the way that Uber and Lyft works for any other human being. All that time just got compressed. Yeah. And we started off with the member. Here's what our providers said. They said the no-show rate really went down. Yeah. And so we did good, good, good across the, the board yeah. in terms of people getting what they need, having a better experience, and providers feeling like, finally, they're coming to the appointment on time. So someone could call that innovation. For me, that was just saying, let's listen and think about a way to solve this problem with the right inputs and stakeholder engagement so that we come up with something that makes a difference. Yeah. Where innovation really begins is addressing the unmet need. The, the case study on that is definitely presented in the efficiency. Okay. So the mm -hmm. multiple order impacts 
Mm-hmm. You know, our providers are happier. No show rates go down, which means we can service more people. We have access to care. But there's another piece that's hard to quantify, but it's so important, which is the dignity and the, oh my goodness, and, and that sense of really being cared for and cared about, and that personal level of attention that says we want to focus just on you. We're mm-hmm. going to pick you up. We're going to take you to your appointment. It cannot be undervalued cannot be undervalued when we innovate for the human value of dignity, of inclusion, of belonging, of fairness, of equity. That's a really great example of of some of the things that you are listening to your members and helping to drive better experiences. And these things don't sound like traditional healthcare coverage, but they are definitely part of health and healthcare. To your point, other countries have been far more aggressive and inclusive on the human services. We're late to that game. We're getting there, but we don't really have the structures to do that. You're breaking that down. You are putting those things in place for your members, addressing food insecurity, addressing the relationship between having food and the role that that plays in medication, in hospitalizations, in mental health. And my goodness, during this pandemic, We have just seen skyrocketing requests from food pantries and the number Mm -hmm. of people who are hungry every day, the number of children who are not being fed, the fact that children, their meals are tied to whether or not they're in school or not. You've been on top of this way ahead of the curve. What are you doing? How do we need to solve this? What are the innovations that are available to us? So I'll tell you how we started. An area of focus for me you mentioned early on is, you know, Black maternal health. I mean, women generally are my focus. But but the inequities suffered by Black women are certainly much larger and worthy of specific attention. So we started off with a pilot with Howard University, Dr. Nunley Bland, to look at women who had pregnancy-induced diabetes and or hypertension to say, let's understand what might be some ways to better support them. And what we learned was when we provided uh, medically tailored meals, it made a difference. And we thought, whoa, we're on to something now. And the cost was so low. Think about it. The cost to, to, to give someone a meal versus have them end up in the emergency room or worse yet, hospitalized or re-hospitalized. The order of magnitude of meal versus those costs, huge, huge difference. So the ROI was overwhelming. So we say, okay, well, we're going to do it for all pregnant women. One of the learnings we had, because this is why you always have more conversations to understand from those receiving the program or intervention, how's it going? What feedback do you have for us? So we were doing that outreach and we're speaking to moms we asked them, so how did you like it? Was it okay? You know, what do you think? Now, about and I want to put a fine point on this. When yeah. you talk about medically tailored meals, it sounds very medicalized. Yeah. You're cooking for people. You're delivering oh, yeah, food. It. Yeah, I was going to yes. say, oh, yeah. I mean, let's, no, let's make it really it. clear. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yes. like you send somebody an email and said, here's what you need to eat. Right. So when we called and asked some of the moms, you know, what you thought about the food, they were like, I didn't have any. So okay, we had to take a breath. What does that mean? You didn't have any, you know? They said they gave it to their children. If a mom has younger children and they don't have food either, no mom is going to eat the food and then have the kids starving. So they would give them the meal. Now, mind you, she's pregnant. We want her to be eating too. So we immediately changed our policy so that it's everyone in the household. Because again, the cost, and if I know a mom is going to give it to her kids anyway, yeah, the smart thing would be to make sure the kids have meals too. And so it's that level of humanness, listening, and acting in a way that is consistent with our values that changes things. So then we expanded the program beyond our pregnant moms so that any provider can make a referral for us to do meals And all of our care managers can make a decision that a member with whom they are engaged should get meals. We made a pivot several years ago to whenever possible, with our members' permission, 
we're going to come see you face to face, you know, pandemic aside, because there's so much that you gain in terms of knowledge and ability to support when you are beginning a relationship by being able to look at that person, be in their lived environment. So we can be speaking to that person who has diabetes about a number of things and then realize that they don't have any food in the house. Or just on our way over there, we realize that when we're talking to them about moving more, that there are no sidewalks, or it doesn't seem like the kind of place where walking around safely is going to be possible. So it's having all those different pieces of information and input so you can change the conversation. So that person, we can now offer them meals. We have a gym program where we could send them a little kit that has stuff that they can do in the home. So do you see how all of a sudden you can start? to reshape. And I love that you introduce dignity to the conversation. Those are two things that you don't hear enough about in insurance, right? Trust and dignity. That should be in every conversation at the front of everyone's minds, because that's what human beings need. Yeah. And when you were talking about the physical act of walking in somebody else's shoes or walking along the sidewalks Mm -hmm. and the streets that they live in to be able to pick up noise pollution, air pollution, do they have access to transportation? How close are they to any number of things so that when you are talking with them about their lives and their needs and their desires and wants, um, you have context. You know what's possible, what's difficult where the support needs to come into being, and also facilitating the trust. I'm here with you, literally meeting you where you are. Yes. Where do you, where do you want to go? And let's work on getting you there. So it's, yeah. just, it's just a totally different experience. So the economist in me has to ask, what are the results of having home-cooked meals sent to the family? What are you seeing? We have three pay-for-performance measures in our contract with the Medicaid agency. Potentially preventable admissions all cause 30-day readmissions and low acuity non-emergency room visits. Across all three measures, the results for meal delivery are statistically significant and positive. We do evaluate when we are having positive outcomes in terms of the member experience, dignity, establishing better trust, and that there's financial return as well. And The meal delivery goes across all three. And so just really pleased with how effective that has been. And and during the pandemic, we then were delivering meals to people who needed to quarantine. We made a huge difference by making it so that someone wasn't leaving the house to go to the grocery store knowing that they were positive. That had to have been a huge contribution to helping decrease the spread of COVID. Transmission rate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And another pillar that you have been boldly and daringly addressing, housing. Mm-hmm. And what I love about when you talk about housing, you put some really important descriptors on it. The first thing that you talk about is safe. Like, is it safe? The second mm-hmm. thing you talk about, is it affordable? And you throw in a lot of things around advocacy. And I've seen your work when you talk about the metrics and the dimensions of social determinants. I have not seen this on others, but on yours, you list one of those needs as legal needs. Say more about how you and your team are thinking about housing as a component of having people have better health. It's the foundation. I am so pleased that for many years, we've had a partnership with the Children's Law Center. Take, for example the family who the mom is doing all she can for her son that's diagnosed with asthma. When we look at claims history, this child is having all their well child visits, all their prescriptions are filled. She's doing everything. Yet this child shows up over and over again with an exacerbation at the emergency room. We have to think about that. Well, what what could be missing? Because this mom is, she's on it. Yeah. Well, if that child is living in a household with mold or rats or roaches, those are triggers in the lived environment. And if that landlord won't do anything about it. And so what I love about having a lawyer on the healthcare team is that suddenly there's a different tone to the conversation. (laughs) 
<laughs> and people start listening and fixing things. That is awesome because that housing and the changes that are needed makes all the difference for that child. Not just in terms of the cost. Imagine that mom who has maybe two other children. So every time if she's a single mom, she has to go to the emergency room for her son, she either has to find someone to take care of the other two children or she has to take all of them to the emergency room. That is incredibly disruptive. As you know, sometimes those asthma exacerbations happen at night and she has to work. I mean, so do you see how it's just not good for anyone? People say, "Karen, like you're going real far on this insurance thing." <laughs> You know? You're taking it to new levels. New levels. However, what we've talked about several times in this conversation is it's not about just pushing one button. You've got to really follow the whole story and make sure your intended impact is going to happen. And if you don't do all the components and understand everything and keep reevaluating and reintervening and supporting, we don't get to the impact. is not something where you just start and walk away. You have to really keep cultivating the additional partnerships we need in order to be successful. So a lawyer on the team for sure. Right now I am petrified about what's going to happen somewhere around 60 days after the pandemic ends. You have all these landlords who are stacking up and waiting to evict thousands of people. And If those families don't have appropriate civil representation, they will get evicted. So a lawyer on the team is critically important. You know, when you mentioned having all of these small details, we've always known that the last mile of healthcare is the hardest and the most expensive. And what you're illuminating really is that until you're on that journey with people every step of it, it's not just the last mile, it's every single inch in that yes. mile. And the moment mm-hmm. where there's an inch that isn't carefully and properly journeyed across, things will unravel. You know, yes. it becomes that weak link and then all of that marathon, it doesn't come to a um, a victorious ending. And that's one of the things that maybe from your conversations and very careful and and loving observation is the need to help people where they are but doing so from a place of a lived experience. Mm-hmm. So your peer support system oh, and program. Yes. I I my okay. favorite. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, say more about, you know, what was the insight and what was the journey of how you created your peer support program? Sure. So I'm going to tell you an interesting place that the recognition came in. Certainly there's the research and the evidence. I listen to calls, member facing calls for teams that engage with members. When we have someone who is from the same neighborhood, when we have someone that is of the same ethnicity, particularly I we've got some of our staff that are Ethiopian. So they speak Amharic. when they are able to begin a call speaking amharic like everything it's like poof all this <laughs> stuff falls away or someone who speaks spanish and and they're saying the the other person on the phone they'll ask him something like oh where are you from and they tell them and it's like again whoosh, all yeah. this stuff falls immediate away immediate rapport yeah yes Trust so is we, built. Mm-hmm. yeah and that's not to say every spanish person is the same every ethiopian but there's something that says ah we have a place to start that's really an important premise with peer support workers peer support workers are from the very neighborhoods probably from the very block <laughs> yeah. that for the person they're serving and and it makes a huge huge difference after trust and dignity comes what you need how i can help you and how we're going to take this journey together one of the most amazing people on our team is a gentleman that does peer support work for persons with substance use disorders. He would prep the person to help them understand the experience and really always say it's your choice because if you try to force someone to do that it doesn't work, right? Yeah. So he would spend all the time on, to get them to the point of are you ready? And then you know what he decided to do? He said, 
would you like me to go with you? He would go with them to go there. And then he did us one better. He goes when they graduate because the program has a graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. He goes every time and he will go there and come back with them if that is what they need. One of my next favorite ones is the peer support workers for women who are pregnant works in the same way. And we cover the services not just while they're pregnant, but for six weeks after, right? Up until they go for their six-week appointment. And there are times where the situation has been more challenging or complex that will say, you know what? Okay, it makes sense that you continue to see her for a bit longer. Because the idea is you want to get people to a point of stability for sure. However, when you get them to a point of resilience, that means they are able to take ownership of their health and well-being. And so beginning to understand this dynamic between human beings and how it ties into health is so, so important. If all we're doing is transactions, we should just expect that it's not going to be so incredibly successful. Peers are a wonderful bridge. We should be there through stabilization and then still be there until they get to that point of resilience. It just makes our members so much stronger. When you talk about peers, the other group that comes to mind our youth, kids. Yes. Oh yes. my gosh. And at this moment in time, their lives, their education, their routines, so disrupted on the stories that we're hearing about the level of hunger, their academic performance, their mental health, maltreatment, um, you know, schools not being able to find kids anymore, that they're yeah. not seeing them enrolled. They're so far behind on their immunizations. I mean, like, yikes. You know, the list just goes on. Mm -hmm. Um you know, with the, the that peer program that you've established for, you know, the different groups, the different needs, what are you seeing in terms of the data, in terms of the conversations, and how are you converting that into solutions and innovations right at this moment? This is a set of needs we've, we've not seen before. Yeah. So we have a, a youth wellness advisory council, and it's a group of youth from across the district <laughs> that keep us so well informed on what's happening on the ground. And it is complicated. The good thing is that from a federal level early on in the pandemic, many of the telehealth restrictions were lifted. And so we've seen this huge spike in behavioral health utilization, which I think is positive. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's in part due to certainly the need. So glad that people are reaching out. It's also that it's less stigmatizing than what people perceive when they go to an office that is specifically behavioral health oriented. So we do have an app. We see growing utilization with that. We're working to support parents as well, because this is, this is hard. We will see. These are uncharted waters. We've leaned into just making sure people know all the types of supports we have and that we have a robust network of providers, different services. You know, hopefully they can choose somewhere in that delivery system of offerings what they need. So we hit on a couple of the pillars of health. You know, we talk about food. We got to have that. We got to have housing. As you said, that is the foundation of all of this. And the other horseman that has been riding through this pandemic has been economic security or yes. for many people, economic insecurity. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you have been way before the pandemic, very keenly aware of the tie between economic security and health. And then creatively and again, boldly as a health plan, you've been thinking about what does the solution look like? So want to introduce what you're doing in terms of how you guys are addressing economic security as it relates to health? Where I started on that was thinking about intergenerational poverty and how does that happen? And it happens because there are a set of social systems and structures that prevent people from getting the right investments in them 
in order for them to succeed. And so we started with a program called Pathways to Work, where we uh, work with our Department of Employment Services to identify people who are on their roles. We interview them and then we hire them for a 12-week program. It's really important that when we do internships, they are paid. So we have a cohort. We try to do two cohorts per year of participants. Here's what the participants get. It's a 12-week paid internship. And they we've had different programs. Like you could get certified in hospitality. You could get certified in claims billing. Because we want them to come out with something. Mm -hmm. What's most important is they have a set of classes and a mentor that are all around the supporting and enabling factors for them to succeed once employed. What we've learned over time is that if someone has not poured in since you were a child, all those things about decision-making, things that help you to present in a confident way, if you've never had those experiences and conversations and learnings, then you're more likely to make a mistake. And then when you make that mistake, you get fired because you're being judged just like everyone else. No one's saying, well, but this person needs more. That's where the equity comes in. They need more investment so that they can be successful. And so we have, since the inception of the program, really revamped and continued to retool the component around all those enabling supports So we have a bank that will come in and help them to set up an account. We talk to them about how to do a budget. We talk to them about ethics and values. It sounds like a a 30,000 foot thing to talk about economic security. Again, it comes down to the details. Here's the other thing we learned. If we have a cohort of participants that are all similarly situated, it doesn't work as well. So you know what we started introducing was other So we had some people who had maybe done a year of college or were in community college, right? They still needed help and support in terms of the learnings and all of that. And I was just so heartened in the conversation with one of our participants where she said, when I looked at, I'm just going to make up a name, Sue, and saw that Sue, she's in community college. She has a kid. She graduated from the same high school. And she can do it. It made me realize I can do it too. It's the conversations where you learn these things that you can then keep applying. And so then from then on, we now have a class that has different people in it, all have needs. However, some of them are farther along on the journey. The second program we have is Bridges to the Future, which is for high school students. It's an after school program where they get similar support, a mentor, and many of the components in the Pathways to Work program, just in a different dose tailored to the fact that they're younger, because we want to get them on the right path. So we shouldn't always be pulling the baby out of the river. Let's look and figure out where the baby is getting tossed into the river and stop them from being tossed in. And so that's our working to go upstream on that. Yeah. Speaking of the upstream and the security issue. You know, your your vision and the the ways that you are addressing people to have well being and health, starting with black maternal health, addressing head on racism, housing, transportation, food insecurity. You know, these are all really crushing problems that intertwined. But when I'm listening to the work that you've done, that at the root of this is violence prevention, really. If you don't Mm -hmm. feel safe, that's what's leading to so many of these other issues. And that's something that you've taken seriously since the earliest days of your Mm -hmm. nursing career. Can you share more about the DC Saves Lives initiatives? How are you addressing and preventing violence, building a culture of safety and security? This one is a tough one. I wish there was an easier solution. We start off by looking at the cure violence model, which was used successfully in Chicago. Chicago, yeah. Yeah. And and it makes all the sense because we have similar issues and challenges in the district. What we know, and it ties to economic security, is if you see no opportunities for progress, if you see no opportunities that say, I will have a stable job, I'll be able to afford the things that meet my basic 
needs, then crime may be an option. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, what's may, the point of education? Right. It becomes a viable survival option. And if you are living in a neighborhood where crime is prevalent and the coercion into crime is often utilized, it, it changes the dynamic of communities. It changes it. And so how do we figure that out? So part of it is making sure whatever we can do on the economic security side, whether it's our direct interventions or advocating for policies and supports around safe and affordable housing, et cetera. The other piece is when violence happens, being able to understand the players, you know, so we have uh, credible messengers that do this work through partnership in terms of our community-based organizations. Uh, However, you know, in the district, we've not had as much success, quite honestly, during the pandemic. And I thought maybe the numbers would have come down. They didn't. No. And so it just says that there is a lot of work to be done because we're paying a claim, right? And so we're knowing when someone went to the emergency room for a gunshot wound or a stab or domestic violence. Yeah. Um, you're backwards looking. You're, you know, yes, your, your claim yeah. state, it's already happened. And so yeah. it gives you context, mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily context turned into foresight. Right, right. Yeah. And so that's the journey we're on is to figure out how else we can be part of it. We want to be leaning into the direction of what works and what we can support. I'm really pleased that in the city's budget, there's been a focus on funding interventions in schools. There are classes that kids take and workshops that they attend, especially in those neighborhoods most affected where they're learning the skills around mediation. All of those types Mm -hmm. of things are happening in our city. It's just that until we can get some of these communities more lifted up, the cancer of violence and crimes won't disappear. And so I don't limit my thinking to health alone. It happens to be the space I work in. However, I'm always looking at how to help human beings achieve their full potential. And you cannot achieve your full potential if you don't have health, wellness, and resilience. That's a personal belief. And so that drives me every day to say, what else? What else? What don't we know? What else can we do? Who else do we need to talk to? How much more do we need to listen? How do we get more informed by data and research? Because we've got to make it so that those we are privileged to serve achieve their full potential. That's what drives me. As people learn more and understand how you are leading and innovating and just rethinking, redesigning what a help plan can be. I just want to put that out there to say, first of all, thank you. It's hard, hard, hard work. And I don't know how much, you know, people don't generally have a love affair with their health plan or they're not really <laughs> excited to, you know, get a call from their health insurance yeah. company. I think you are doing an awful lot to change that brand experience, that, mm-hmm. that feeling, that association. So well done you. We should have hope. The pandemic demonstrated how quickly we could pivot to change laws, loosen up restrictions, work more together around a number of things related to health. I don't want us to lose that, that sense of urgency, that sense of we can do it, let's get it done. Were there bumps in the road? Absolutely. However, at warp speed, We made changes that benefited people, helped them during a pandemic to achieve their full potential. That says we can do it and everything else is an excuse. (laughs) So, (laughs) So as we go forward, I want us to approach all of this with that same sense of hope and urgency so that we change things for the better. The fierce urgency of now. Yes, absolutely. Nurse and bold innovator Karen Dale has a clear vision, big energy, and a career and impressive track record of developing sustainable and enduring solutions for, as she says, those we are privileged to serve achieve their full potential. And how does she do that? As the market president and CEO of AmeriHealth Caritas, a Medicaid managed care plan in Washington, D.C., Karen is carefully listening leading with humility 
and innovating with solutions for the critical everyday challenges faced by and impacting the health, well-being, and resilience of its 100,000 members, their families, and the communities they love and live in. Karen is also the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, a newly created position at Amera Health Caritas. Together with the members she trusts, she's launching solutions that link workforce, workplace, health equity, and supplier diversity with measurable business and cultural outcomes. Having held multiple positions of leadership during the past two decades, Karen has a skill and a tenacity for partnering with a broad group of stakeholders to address policies and other key factors impacting the delivery of healthcare services. These efforts include the use of digital tools to aid in the management of chronic diseases, peer-to-peer outreach involving community health workers and peer specialists, and a human-centered member engagement approach. Karen's vision is notably reflected in key programs addressing Black maternal health, racism, housing, intergenerational poverty, transportation, violence interruption, and food insecurity. A nation's healthcare system reflects its values. As people look at how they care for themselves and their fellow citizens, the pandemic has been a precipitous, foundation-shaking reminder that, like it or not, believe it or not, we are in this together. A pandemic like COVID-19 reveals the best of our ability to cope with significant health system challenges, and it points its finger at everything that's not working and who it's not working for. Healthcare in America has been the focal point of political turmoil for decades. Understandably so. Millions of people still do not have health insurance coverage or have limited access to care. An aging population is living longer and their care is costing more. The cost of care in the U.S. is the highest in the world. And because of this, the cost to the health of our nation is immeasurable. Long before the pandemic, Karen was thinking about the social determinants of health. It's no wonder that she leads a team whose mission statement reads, to help people get care, stay well, and build healthy communities. Her innovations provide a roadmap for people in communities, health plans, and the health insurance industry, not only to survive, but to thrive. And when we do this, we not only achieve better health and financial outcomes, we are actually planning and ensuring for a healthier nation. It's highly unusual for a country to dramatically change its health system, its health status, its service, its funding, or its delivery without a provocation of magnitude, like a war or, say, like a global pandemic. But as Karen observes, we can do this. And when we don't, the rest, it's just an excuse. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.